Good evening. Welcome to SIA's Capital Land Virtual Dialogue Session. Earlier in March this year, Capital Land announced its proposal to restructure the group's business by consolidating the group's investment management platforms as well as its lodging business under a newly listed entity of Capital Land Investments and placing the existing real estate development business under the private ownership of Capital Land held by CLA Real Estate Holdings. This proposal looks to pivot Capital Land from a largely traditional real estate developer to an asset manager that is asset light, derives more fee-based income, and extends on the ongoing Capital Land 3.0 transformation with an AUM of 115 billion Sing dollars this restructuring exercise puts Capital Land Investment as the third largest listed real estate investment manager, or REM globally, and the largest listed REM, REIM in Asia. I'm sure shareholders of Capital Land would be excited, though with questions as Capital Land embarks on this major transformation. I'm pleased to have the senior management of Capital Land this evening, Mr. Lee Chi Kun, Group CEO and Mr. Andrew Lim, Group CFO, to share additional insights on its future plans and answer questions shareholders may have. Without further ado, may we have Mr. Lee Chi Kun to open this session with an opening remarks, followed by Mr. Andrew Lim to share a presentation on the proposed restructuring exercise. Mr. Lee. Thank you, Robson, for the very good introduction. Hi, uh, my name is Chi Kun. It's been uh, four months since we last announced this uh, transaction. And uh, maybe just allow me to do a very quick uh, re recap of the rationale why we are proposing this uh, restructuring. The key reason is that uh, Capital N as a company, we have uh, consistently been trading at about 20 to 25% discount to NAV in the last uh, 20 years. And uh, if you look at the uh, business of uh, Capital Land, what Capital Land has built is uh, it's built up a development business and also a very strong asset management business anchored around especially the REITs uh, uh, track record that we have built. And if you look around, the, if you compare the uh, trading price of uh, Capital Land against the other developers in the region, whether it's in Hong Kong, in Singapore, or in Australia. Typically, the developers trade a discount, discount anything between you know, 20 to, to 50%. And, uh, but we look at the business of Capital Land. It has built up a significant asset management uh, uh, arm you know, with uh, REITs, uh, private equity funds, and also the lodging business. Uh, we are of the view that you know if we can get the um, uh, asset management piece to be a separately listed entity, it can potentially trade uh, much closer to some of the uh, other asset managers that are very well managed also in the region, uh, and we know that uh, some of them uh, can trade easily between you know more than one times NAV and the and the really um, uh, well managed uh, asset manager can trade about three times uh, NAV. So, so that's really the, the reason why we are doing this proposal, where it involves the privatization of the development business, allowing shareholders to unlock value in the short run, but continuing to be able to stay invested on the listed part uh, with the asset management uh, side of the business, so they can continue to enjoy the upside as we, as we drive the growth of the asset management uh, part of the business. So we worked very hard in the last few months to get the documents ready. It has been uploaded. Uh, maybe the key point for me to just highlight in, in, um, uh, amongst the, the thick documents that you may have uh, uh, gone through is the opinion from the IFA, in this case, uh, Evercore. Uh, it has given the opinion that the consideration for the privatization of the development business uh, to be a fair and reasonable one. So that's an a important view that I thought that I should highlight. And I will leave uh, Andrew to maybe go through the details 
uh, of um, a few slides that uh, um, you know just just to summarize uh, the the details of the transaction, and we can go into Q and A after that. Thank you. Thanks, Chikun, and good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us in this next hour and to uh, see us for hosting. Uh, so my name is Andrew Lim, and uh, I will take about 10 to 15 minutes to walk you through some of the key details that uh, Chikun spoke of. Uh, we'll use a few slides to, uh, to uh, um, illustrate uh, some of the key points. So without further ado, let's take you through to the first slide. Uh, as as Robson and, and Chikun have mentioned, I think this... Um, the proposed restructuring is about Capital Land as a diversified real estate company that many of you know, uh, looking to sharpen our strategic focus. And the decision to separate two, the group into two distinct businesses, Capital Land Development and Capital Land Investment, is predicated along the lines of what we have observed over our, uh, the last 10 years, principally through the trading price and the value that the market ascribes to our business as a diversified real estate company. And as Chikun mentioned, we noticed that development businesses tend to be valued at a discount to our net asset value, whereas real estate investment managers tend to be valued at a premium uh, to their net asset value. And so we made the decision to separate along these lines and to privatize capital land development, which will include our uh, uh, comprise our development business and match the nature of that business, which is long-term development, a gestation of a, uh, a capital with the patience that that capital uh, typically requires. On the other side, by listing uh, capital land investments, which includes our fund management, our lodging management, and a healthy amount of uh, stabilized, high-quality assets on balance sheet in a capital-efficient uh, uh, business, we believe that this will illuminate value and unlock that value both in the short as well as long term. So again, to illustrate what Chikun was talking about early on, if you look at the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see that Traditional real estate developers have tended to trade at a quite a substantial discount to NAV. That is represented by the brown or orange line uh, that you see. On the other hand, the best-in-class REIMs, or real estate investment managers, tend to trade at a healthy premium, whether you measure that premium on a price-to-net asset value basis or on a forward price-to-earnings basis. And so when you look at this material difference in both of these metrics, you begin to realize that there is the ability for us to unlock long-term value by separating the businesses that we have traditionally been engaged in and allowing us to trade more purely as a real estate investment manager, REIM. You see that the blue line in the middle is Capital Land's own metrics. And as a diversified real estate company, um, employing both sides of the business, one would typically expect us to trade somewhere in the middle. This is the potential for us to unlock long-term value through this strategic restructuring. Since we announced the transaction on March the 22nd, the stock price has responded very well and we are now trading at a 14-20% to 20 premium to that level pre-announcement. So we also believe that there is an uh, unlocking in, of value is in the short term as we lead up to the uh, EGM on August the 10th. On this slide, what we've summarized is the uh, consideration that we are setting aside for each investor uh, of Capital Land. For each share that you own in Capital Land, you will receive three components. You will receive one share in Capital Land Investment, and you will, see, you will receive a bundle of 95.1 cents in cash, as well as 0.155 units in CICT, representing the consideration of the privatization of capital land development. In cash terms, on the left-hand side, you will see that the single share of CLI is valued at $2.82, which is underpinned by the net asset value of capital land investment struck at the end of uh, December 2020. If you include the 95 cents of cash as well as the cash value of the CICT units, you arrive at the total implied consideration of $4.10. 
And here we have set out against the, the, the premium, against the last trading day pre-announcement, as well as the longer term uh, volume weighted average price. Again, representing this upside in the short term and the unlocking of value, which we believe we are presenting to eligible shareholders. I'll take a few minutes to introduce Capital Land Investment. Essentially, CLI, Capital Land Investment, will comprise two main businesses. A fee income related business comprising our REIT and fund managers. We have six REITs and over 20 private equity real estate funds. Managing a total of 78 billion of what I call funds under management or FUM for short. The other part of the fee income related business is our lodging management platform, where we are one of the largest, longest stay operators of uh, hospitality. Com we currently manage over 27 billion of what I call lodging real estate AUM or REAUM. The other part of the business is what we call our real estate investments. These are our equity stakes in our REITs, ranging from 18 to 40%. Our equity stakes in our private funds ranging from 6 to 55%. And as I mentioned earlier, we have included about 10 billion of REAUM worth of investment properties on the balance sheet of CLI, which we believe we can monetize in the next 12 to 36 months as they are high quality operating mature assets that we believe we can convert into FUM in the near term. CLI brings five key competitive advantages, which we believe are compelling, distinctive, and sustainable. First, while we are global, we will be a global listed REIT or REIM, we have a leadership position in Asia, where over 80% of our REAUM of 115 billion is anchored in Asia. And again, this is based on our track record of growing a business in our core markets, such as China, Singapore, and India. The FUM and the fee-related earnings that we are able to deliver can be derived from a variety of core fee income streams, including our fund management business, our asset management capability, where we manage over 330 assets throughout the CLI group, and a best-in-class lodging and operating platforms particularly in our longer stay hospitality space, as well as our retail platform. This gives us three distinct fee earning engines. Our fee earning capability has a proven track record. Over the last three years, we've been able to grow our FUM at over 15% annually and our FRE at over 12%. On the hospitality side of things, we've been able to grow our units under management at about a 20% annual clip over the last three years. So we bring a proven track record of growth in our core business. While we will be separating Capital Land into two sister companies, privatized CLD and a listed CLI, we are very determined to retain a Capital Land ecosystem, which we believe contains key advantages, including the ability to share talent, the ability to share services and uh, work with each other as capital and idea generation partners. We have secured a right of first refusal for any assets that CLD may have on its balance sheet that may be converted into FUM. And I will speak about this uh, in, in short order. Last but not least, CLI will bring with itself a very experienced senior and asset management and investment management team that will enable us to hit the ground running on day one. In terms of growth, we will rely on three key pillars. First and foremost, most importantly, fund management platform as our core engine of growth, where we will look to grow FUM at a consistent clip. We will look to drive that growth of our listed funds business, namely our REIT platforms, which have been growing very healthily in the last five to 10 years and we will deepen and diversify our stable of private equity funds. On the lodging side of things, where scale is absolutely the name of the game, we currently have about 120,000 keys under management. We will look to grow and target 160,000 keys under management by 2023. 
And finally, a disciplined capital recycling strategy will help us continue to renew the portfolio and to seed new funds and support our REITs as they grow. My last slide is to give you a sense of how we see the roadmap of growth in FUM for CLI going forward. On the left-hand side, you see where we are at in terms of FUM. At the end of 2020, we were about 78 billion. And we had grown that FUM at an average of north of 11% annually for the last five years. So we are able to deliver a consistent growth of north of 10% in FUM. And that is where we are confident in continuing to grow at an organic clip, which represents the first of our growth buckets that you see on the right-hand side. Supplementing that organic growth, we have two pillars representing pipeline for CLI. The first is our 10 billion or so of REAUM that is going to be sitting on the CLI balance sheet. And again, this, is, this represents stable operating and mature properties that we will look to convert into FUM over the next 12 to 36 months, relying on our discipline on capital recycling. The second pipeline sits within CLD, our sister company, and where we have about 7.6 billion of assets that we believe will take a little bit longer to incubate and mature, but which we also are confident that we can turn into FUM by virtue of the fact that we will have a right of first refusal for any of our vehicles to acquire these assets when they are ready to be converted. Lastly, but certainly not least, strategic acquisitions will play a key role in the growth of CLI. In 2019, as part of Capital N 3.0, we made a very strategic decision to combine with Ascender Singh Bridge, which brought with it an entry and allowed us to recalibrate our sector exposure into new economy, as well as giving us a third core market in India. These are the types of acquisitions and strategic combinations which we will look to pursue in the years ahead, allowing CLI to continue to drive FUM growth as we target 100 billion in FUM by 2024, 160,000 keys in lodging management by 2023. We will look to continue to improve on our ability to earn fees of the FUM that we manage and which is measured by an important ratio called FRE and FUM. We will look to continue a sustainable dividend policy, which we have announced at no less than 30% of cash pad me, maintaining the policy that we had with CL. And last but certainly not least, we will look to continue to drive ROE, setting ourselves a double-digit ROE target on a sustainable basis. So that will end the sort of formal part of my presentation and we've got certainly lots of time for questions, but we hope that this allows you to get a better sense of what we are envisioning as uh, CLI's growth platform. We are very energized by our ability to deliver growth and we look for your support at the upcoming EGM on August the 10th. Thank you. Robson. Thank you, Andrew. Sias will now kickstart the Q&A session by asking a few questions. The proposed restructuring exercise fundamentally changes the modules operandi for Capital Land from a developer property group which Capital Land was established and well known for to a global REIM. This places Capital Land investment in a totally different and new playing field altogether, competing against the lights of Blackstone Group and Brookfield Asset Management. Now, how confident is management competing against the lights of global REIMs, especially when it comes to fundraising and acquisition of properties? Moreover, how similar or different would the strategy and operations of capital and investments be to peers and the risks associated with the REIM model? Thank you, uh, Robson. Um, let me let me take the, take a crack at this uh, question. The I think Capital Land has uh, built up a very strong track record reputation in our part of the world in Asia. Uh, we have um, more than twenty years of experience. In, I mean, of course, Singapore, China, Vietnam, India, and um, we have teams in Japan, in Korea, Australia. So. This um, market, in terms of the, the teams that we have built up, 
you know, gives us the ability to source for deals, to look for deals that are off market, you know, to be able to look at uh, structuring uh, interesting projects that we could acquire. Uh, I think in today's market, the, the key ingredient is uh, to be able to build up teams, uh, to be able to have access to all these uh, different investment opportunities. And once you can get access to all these opportunities, actually raising money is at, in today's climate is actually quite, quite easy. But having said that, if you take a step back, I mean, Capital Land has actually been very active in terms of um, raising money from uh, institutional investors and even uh, high net worth uh, investors in the, uh, in the, actually for the more, more than 10 years. Uh, investors from the uh, from Americas, from Europe, from Middle East, and even from Asia. So I wouldn't say that this is something that's new. It is, but uh, by separating um, Capital Land into a development business and a listed entity focusing on REAM, it sharpens the focus of the of the team to focus on scouting for investment opportunities, and also to focus on raising third-party capital that will allow us to continue to grow and to grow the AUM and be competitive. And I am of the view that uh, Asia uh, is going to be the key engine of growth in the next 10 to 20 years. And being, you know, having that, that global that presence in Asia will definitely give us that, that advantage. Um, we, are not, we don't have the same history as uh, Brookfield and um, uh, Blackstone. Of course, they have done very well, very successful uh, companies. You know, we have our own heritage, our own his history, our own strengths in Asia. And I believe that we need to chart our own path, find our own levels of competitiveness and become asset managers uh, that can be globally competitive, but with a very strong foundation in Asia. Thank you for the very assuring and comprehensive answer, Chikun. Sias has a second question. The parent company, Capital Land, um, is committed to continue supporting Capital Land investments and its goals, such as increasing FUM from 78 billion to 100 billion Sing dollars by 2024. Capital Land investments, um, it's envisaged will be granted the right of first refusal to tap on Capital Land as one key pipeline of investment opportunities. Yet with Capital Land and its development arm privatised, there's concern that information sharing and transparency between parties may somewhat be blurred. To this end, can management comment on the structure and relationship between Capital Land investments and Capital Land and the safeguards enacted to protect the interests of minority shareholders? Moreover, would there be opportunities for Capital Land investment to grow its asset base through third-party assets that is outside of the Capital Land Group? So, post the restructuring, Capital Land investment will be a, um, separately listed. Capital Land development will be a 100% privately held entity. Um, there are uh, agreements in terms of uh, working out in terms of how um, capital and investment can provide services, whether it's property management or financial shared services to capital and devel uh, development on the private side. There are also rights of uh, first refusal uh, from the development from the private side to the listed side. And both entities have its own boards. You know, I will be the CEO of the listed entity, Mr. Jason Liao. He will be the CEO of the Capital Land Development. Uh, both of us have duties and responsibility to our own respective boards. What you will see a lot more collaboration between Capital Land Investment and Capital Land Development will be in terms of how we look for opportunities on in the ground, especially in various markets where we have uh, common teams in uh, Vietnam, in China, in um, uh, India where we can source for opportunities together. Because markets are huge, it's better to share resources to find, um, first, the most important thing is to win the market opportunity. Then you decide how you want to share. So that's the basis of how the collaboration will take place. And uh, I want to assure the, um, the, all the investors that there will be strict corporate governance because uh, I will be the CEO of the listed entity 
I need to make sure that all the information, all the approval is uh, 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 done properly through proper approvals and uh, uh, that I need to seek from the uh, Capital and Investment Board. Thank you. I think corporate governance is something that's very fundamental uh, to the way uh, Capital Land, uh, the group is going to be operating going forward. I think that comprehensive answer is very reassuring. Now, there's some sentimental loyal shareholders who have started with Capital Land since day one, seeking exposure to the property development market in Singapore. Despite the uncertainty associated with the development arm, Property development has been a significant driver of the group's revenue and operating profit. So on a pro forma basis, what will be the impact, i.e. comparative decline in revenue and profits for capital land investments vis-a-vis -vis the current capital land group? With the exclusion of the development arm, can shareholders expect greater clarity on operating cash flow and in turn dividend policy, capex, etc.? Thanks, Robson. That's a, a very comprehensive question, so I'll try to unpack that slowly. Um, yes, it is true that we are removing a part of the business from Capital Land Group, and one that um, uh, it's absolutely fair to say Capital Land started out life as we, we began life as our developer. So there's, there is an, an emotional uh, uh, component to this decision that we did not enter into lightly. And it's, as we mentioned at the, at the top half of the hour, this was a decision that we undertook after a lot of uh, discussion uh, with internally as well as with our key stakeholders, members of the board and so on and so forth. But for reasons that we have set out, we feel that this is the best thing to do for the company in terms of unlocking value for shareholders, which is, I would say, one of the key reasons uh, management is here to, you know, it, it, and, has to, and has to deliver on. It's one of our fundamental principles. Um, so there will be a difference in how Capital Land is able to generate its, its profits. We believe that Capital Land investment will be a very cash generative business because most of the um, activities that CLI will undertake are actually in, in businesses that are very recurring in nature. If you think about fee income that you earn uh, because you are managing capital, a lot of that is a you know recurring. Uh, it happens on a recurring nature. Uh, a lot of the um, capital that we are able to recycle is quasi recurring in nature. If you are able to be disciplined about it and you are recycling a consistent amount of capital uh, each and every year, so yes, indeed, there is a function of that that is market dependent. But the very nature of managing third-party capital for a fee is in itself recurring in nature, which is, I think, one reason why public markets tend to value REIMs higher than uh, traditional real estate developers. If you think about a real estate development business, while it can be very profitable, and yes, we have made some good profits over the years, the nature of the, the development business is one that is lumpy. It, is, it takes time from the, from the moment you secure the land to breaking ground, construction, completing your development, handing over the keys, and then being able to um, register your revenues and hopefully good profits. That is a process of you know, maybe two, three, four, even five years. And I think because there is this time value that is imputed into the development business, the capital markets, uh, the public markets tend to treat that at a sort of a discount to something that is more recurring that happens every year, happens with greater predictability if you can manage it. So I think there will be a change in the, in the, in the complexion of how we are able to deliver profit. It then also informs us in terms of how we set our dividend policy and so on and so forth. We have made the decision to keep our dividend policy uh, consistent for now for two reasons. One is to give our current shareholders and hopefully shareholders of CLI going forward a sense of familiarity that this is, there is no change in the current policy and we've been able to consistently pay out north of 40% of our cash padme. We don't envisage uh, uh, the, any difference in the ability to do so. Now, we are also cognizant of the fact that we are emerging from a very difficult operating environment caused by the pandemic. We are in what I would like to say uh, the period of recovery that uh, whilst is positive, remains uncertain. And so as a management team, we took the view that it's 
better to take a conservative view on our dividend policy today. Let's see what the cash generating and recurring income nature of the business uh, uh, takes us, assuming that the recovery continues and we get to a more normalized operating environment in the next 12 to 24 months. And once that happens, we believe that the underlying business is going to put us in position to be able to review our dividend policy. And if we feel confident about that, we should be able to provide more guidance on how we can elevate that policy more in keeping with the cash generative nature of an REIM. Thank you, Andrew. I think shareholders and the market will be very assured that putting sentiments aside, there's change but continuity and better sustainability. Because I think at the end of the day, the changes are driven by fundamentals uh, for a better future. So, you know, without further ado, I, I'll see whether we can answer some questions from shareholders. Okay, there's this question to say, um, what's the current NAV of CLD versus NAV in December 2020? Is CLD still playing 0 0.9 times NAV based on the latest balance sheet since there are changes in businesses? So that comes from a Kai Ming Tan. Andrew, would you like to take the question? Sure. Um, so if you look at the NAV uh, as of December 2020, I believe it was somewhere around $4.30. Uh, $4 uh, if you take out that amount of uh, CLD, it's, I think it's roughly about 30 to 40% of the business that has been, it will be taken out of, of CL. Uh, in terms of what has changed since then, uh, it, it's still fairly consistent. There is no real difference in how the businesses have been operating since we have struck the, the NAV split date as, as of 30th December 2020. Sorry, 0 0.9 times. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, it is 0.95 uh, NAV. That's right, yeah. So the... Let's take the next question. The next question is by a Teo Jin Jie. And the question is, do you go by the 220 rule for fees whereby management fees for the funds placed with CLI is 2% per annum and CLI gets 20% of the fund's profits? Andrew? Okay, thanks Robson. I think this question refers to uh, typical 2 and 20 rule uh, that gets applied to private equity funds. Um, we typically don't disclose that for proprietary reasons. I think you can safely say that in, we will look to match the type of fund structures that the best-in-class REIMs are able to achieve, particularly with the new private funds that we are launching in you know, more in recent times that you saw, for example, with Cap1 in 2019. Uh, and with the two new funds that we've just launched this year, uh, Capital Land India Logistics Fund 2, as well as our new Korean DC Fund 2. These are more typical of the types of fee structures that you should see and come to expect with, with, the late, more, uh, with current private equity fund products. So whilst I can't say for sure that of, uh, categorically that these are 2 and 20 type funds, they are certainly in line with what other fund managers are able to uh, structure with their own PE product. Well, let's see, what's the next question? Next questions come from Chun. Sorry. The next question is from Chong Wai Edward Lau. And the question is How is your executive assessment of the new CLI targeted revenue and projected earnings and return to investors at a point of spin off and 12 months down the road? Okay. Um, again, we. If you look at the pro forma uh, P&L for CLI, you will see that we are on the point of emerging from a very difficult uh, 2020. The pro forma P&L for 2020 actually was a loss. I'm sure you will recognize that. But on an adjusted basis, where we removed the very substantial fair value impairments and fair value write downs, uh, caused by you know the unprecedented situation with COVID, we turned that around into a positive EBITDA of about 1.3 billion. 
again, we believe that the business of CLI is a very cash generative business. And on an ongoing normalized basis, we are confident that we'll be able to deliver enough cash uh, profit that will allow us to sustain a very healthy dividend policy and enable us to set a starting uh, ROE of at least 10%, which for those of you who are shareholders will know is where we ended off in 2019. And we felt that it was important to start from that as a, as a beginning point, given that we are going through a fundamental restructuring, we should at least offer our shareholders that same level of return uh, on a stabilized, sustainable basis once we have uh, emerged fully from COVID-19. I think shareholders will be very assured and be applauding to this answer. <laughs> well, let's go to the next question. Next question comes from uh, Jacqueline Quack. And the question is, what's the impact of this restructuring exercise on capital lands representation in the various indices, example, STI, FTSE, e EPRA, NARIT, et cetera? Okay, we don't anticipate index representation to uh, alter dramatically. Obviously, it will uh, right size based on the, the market cap of the business that we are listing. So given that we are listing the business at uh, a share price, uh, an NAV of 282 per share, then many of the indexes that we are on that are based on market weighted will uh, rebalance their holdings of CLI respectively. Hopefully we trade well out of the gate and uh, the indices will take that into consideration. The one index that we do get uh, questions around is indeed the FTSE NERIT index. Uh, as those of you who will know, the NERIT index is an index that is uh, real estate focused and, and is uh, designed specifically for companies that own physical real estate. Uh, now, fund managers don't technically by design own real estate physically. We manage vehicles that own real estate. So by definition, the FTSE NERIT tends to exclude REIMs that, own any, that earn fees for anything more than 25% of their overall profit. Whilst this is not the case for CLI on day one, uh, if we execute our growth plan and grow our fee income as we intend to do, then there is the potential that the FTSE NARIT, we will no longer qualify for an index such as the FTSE NARIT. You have seen um, other REIMs uh, similarly drop off FTSE NARIT when their fee incomes past that 25% threshold. Uh, that is something that we are uh, prepared for and we believe that is in keeping with our overall objective to grow fee income as our, as our core business line. Asset light and growth in fee income. The best is yet to be. <laughs> so next question. From this guy called PS. I don't know whether it's a guy or girl, but the question is, May I know how much does Tomase holds in CLI and CICT? So the um, look-through holding of, uh, for Tomasic into CLI will be the same as Tomasic's holding, effective holding in, in CL today, given that we are distributing in specie our shares up to all shareholders. So that will be roughly around 52% uh, on day one. In terms of CICT, uh, Tamasic doesn't typically own stakes in any of our REITs. And that is why, um, because CICT is part of this uh, distribution in specie and the overall restructuring, Tamasic has elected to forego its um, uh, 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 pro rata share of CICT and include that as part of the consideration for the privatization of CLD. So your share in CICT, the 6% that we are distributing in PC, will now pass through entirely to eligible shareholders. That does not include Tomasic. Right. So what's the next question? The next question comes from Tan Boon Leong. Um, and the question is, what's the book value per share of Capital Land? And is there any goodwill that will take place? from those who take over the capital lens. I'm not sure if the question is grammatically correct, but I think 
question is on book value and goodwill. Yeah, so the book value, uh, again, as I mentioned, I believe was 4.30 at the end of the year on which we struck the various uh, separations between CLD and CLI. Um, because this is a distribution in specie, uh, there is no goodwill per se. There's no premium that is on offer uh, from CLA to, to the eligible shareholders. So you will get your share of CLI at, uh, at one times NAV, uh, which is $2.82. Right. Oh, let's see whether you have uh, what other questions that's going to come on stream. Next question is from Kumar Rawani Kumar. And the question is, can you comment on CLI payout ratio and the indicative dividend yield as compared to CL? Okay, Kumar, I think we've we touched a little bit about this in terms of our dividend policy, again, for consistency and to be prudent uh, coming out of a uh, very in, uh, difficult period last year. We've decided to keep our dividend policy the same. So it is unchanged, no less than 30% of our cash pad me. You, will, you should hopefully also know that we've traditionally been able to pay out north of 40% of our cash padme. We remain confident that we will be able to do so uh, under the CLI uh, ratios. Um, if you look at what that translates to in yield terms, many REIMs typically pay out anywhere between say 25 to 4% yield. And we expect to be within that range as well going forward. Thank you. Thank you. What's the next question? From a Kandipan Rangasamy. The question reads Currently, CLI has been listed at one times NAV. The global well managed peers are trading at 2.9 times. So, where do you see CLI being traded at a fair value, assuming the NAV remains the same? Okay, questions coming in fast and furious, and they're very good questions. So, uh, we'll, we'll keep plugging along. So, um, the IFA, if you look at the IFA letter, when they did their, uh, what they call the sum of the parts analysis to ascertain the fair value of uh, CLI, they arrived at a figure between 1.1 and about 1.3 times NAV. Again, by adding up the various parts of, uh, of CLI. So given that we are uh, proposing to prov uh, give each share of CLI at one times NAV, then what that should suggest to you is that if you accept the IFA's uh, uh, estimation of our fair value, then there is should be immediate upside to CLI's value um, given that we have these businesses in place. Um, now, you will see that CLI comprises various different parts. right? We've got the fee income side of the business, but we also have a fairly heavy uh, equity side of the business that comprises our stakes and our REITs, our funds, as well as our balance sheet assets. As the CLI evolves over time and we are able to grow our fee income business and have that contribute more and more to the overall profit of CLI, we hope that that one times NAV or 1.1 to 1.3 times fair value that the IFA has ascribed to us will grow over time and allow us to elevate our valuation to resemble that of the best-in-class REIMs, which, as you rightly point out, uh, can be trading as high as 2.9, three times NAV. That is the long-term value unlocking that we aspire to achieve for shareholders. It will take some time, but we are very committed and determined to be able to do that for shareholders. Thank you. Right. Let's see if there are further questions. They're coming in hard and fast. Well, next question from Samantha Chua. This exercise looks to moving CLI towards being asset light. Just wondering where does the lodging piece fit in, especially with the current uncertainty? Wouldn't the exclusion make CLI even more asset light? Okay, this is a very good question, uh, Samantha. And let me try to explain why we put CL, uh, a lodging platform into CLI. Um, it's important to note that our lodging management platform is actually very capital-like, so asset-like to use your point. Um, this is because the principle of our lodging management platform is very similar to our fee management platform. Our fee management platform or our funds management platform is essentially managing third-party capital and earning a fee for it. Our lodging management platform employs the same principle. 
I am managing third-party assets owned by uh, you know, asset owners around, our, around the world and I'm earning a fee for managing your asset under the Escort banner, the Citadines banner, the Somerset banner and so on and so forth. So in principle, it is the same uh, philosophy where we are managing your asset for you, your capital for you, and you pay us a fee for that. It is actually very capital and very asset light. Hence, we believe that these two businesses belong together as a REIM, a real estate investment manager. And that is why when we combine the 78 billion of funds under management from our REITs and our funds and the 28 billion of lodging REAUM, we get a total, what I call REAUM, fee income earning AUM of 115 billion, which puts us in league with the top tier of listed fund managers around the world. So if you take a step back, uh, this is not an asset-heavy business at all. In fact, it's a very asset-like business. And if you think about companies such like Marriott, uh, IHG, who operate on the same type of platform, very asset uh, efficient, very capital efficient, they trade also at very healthy multiples, 15 to 20 times EV EBITDA, which is why we believe that as long as we can scale up the lodging platform to 160,000 keys and beyond, it will enable us to really start to enjoy meaningful benefits in terms of scale and be able to contribute an increasing amount of profit to the overall CL uh, earnings line. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, what's the next question? Let's see. Uh, again from Jacqueline Quack. CLI may have waived certain fees relating to the acquisition or divestments undertaken by its REITs in the past. Now, would this practice be discontinued going forward? Wow, this is a good question. And I suppose depending on which hat you wear, uh, the answer uh, may be good or not good. Uh, anyway, I think, it's in, uh, I think for substantial transactions uh, occurring between sponsor and REIT, the philosophy is that the acquisition fee per se um, was not, uh, strictly speaking, earned because the, the asset sits on the sponsor and the sponsor is giving this to the, the REIT. Obviously, at an arm's length basis, that has to be sanctioned by the minority unit holders. So in this case, I think it, the, the, the uh, principle of that is that we should not, uh, the REIT should not charge a, a fee and it's not earned. Or the REIT manager shouldn't charge a fee. So I, th I would say that if you believe in that philosophy and that principle, then it should not change. But we haven't actually you know, encoded this or put this in stone. It has been more on a transaction by transaction basis. And we look at the amount of effort that the REIT manager has spent in acquiring the asset, uh, which is, I think, the right way to look at whether the fee is earned and whether it should be fair to charge that fee. Yes. From PS again, the question reads, with growing climate concerns, what ESG goals and target have been set for CLI? Okay, um, ESG uh, rightly, uh, as you point out, PS is um, no longer a nice to have. It is absolutely fundamental to uh, sustainability of the business. So uh, sustainability of our environment, sustainability of our people and good governance is actually central to the sustainability of the organization. Uh, and we've begun that journey long time ago with Capital Land Group. We have a master plan that we launched last year that we are very committed to achieving. This is a 10 year master plan that sets out our very aspirational goals in E, S and G uh, for 2030. In the short term, those goals will carry on into CLI. Um, we have committed to reviewing our master plan every two years to see if there needs to be a recalibration of our targets. And in fact, that recalibration is already underway. Not because we are going to be CLI, but because the evolving landscape for ESG is so rapid and things are happening so quickly and uh, the importance of re-evaluating our goals is becoming greater and greater that we can no longer sit still for a year and a half and then decide what to do with these with our targets. It is becoming even more incumbent on us to revisit our priorities much more frequently and much more quickly. So for now, we've, we're keeping our targets set in the 2030 master plan as is. They will come across to CLI 
obviously not the development related targets, but for our fund management businesses, for our lodging management businesses, all of our S targets, all of our governance targets will come over because they are consistent. And then in 2022, when we are due to announce any changes in our master plan, I think that will put us in good position to recalibrate targets that are perhaps more specific to CLI for uh, f uh, going forward in as part of the master plan. All right. Thank you. Let's see what's the next question. From Kandipan Rangasamy again. Do you see any headwinds for the markets where CLI currently operates in the near term, where it could affect its NAV? What are the contingency measures put in place to mitigate any headwinds? Uh, thank you uh, for the question. The, our read of the current market situation is that um, uh, with the rollout of the vaccination across the various markets that we are operating in, we should be able to get past, you know, in terms of the worst of uh, the pandemic crisis. And I think there are indicators in the, uh, maybe in the equities market where you do, do see a recovery ahead of uh, even the, the real markets. So that's the, the general sense. Um, uh, last year, we took a big uh, write down in terms of the various, uh, some of the asset classes, especially on the retail and the lodging side, which were most badly affected because uh, of COVID. Uh, issues, uh, isolation issues, people cannot travel, people cannot go to the malls, uh, and those asset classes were the most uh, impacted. But uh, our sense is that the, the worst is over, and uh, I think the important thing for any asset manager is to be able to build a portfolio that is um, uh, well diversified, that's balanced across different asset classes, so you have a more resilient portfolio that uh, is uh, uh, strong enough to ride through any um, pressures that may be confronted in any markets or any types of the asset classes. So that's how we think about uh, in terms of the capital allocation strategy. Right, thank you, Chikun. Let's see. From Alvin Tan, can you comment on the business situation in China and CLI's investment that's going to be in China in the future? Uh, hi, Alvin. Um, China is the biggest market for capital land and also CLI uh, post restructuring and it's going to continue to be the biggest and going to be very important and significant in our part of the business. I did mention earlier that uh, we want to be a globally competitive asset manager with a strong foundation in Asia. And if you look around in Asia, the market that, you know, that offers the, the, the biggest opportunity in terms of uh, investments, in, in terms of uh, growth, at this point in time, I mean, we cannot discount China. Of course, there are other markets like India, like Japan, like Vietnam, Australia, and Korea. But at this point in time, China is still going to feature very importantly. We have strong boots on the ground, more than 20 years of uh, history. Uh, we have strong local teams and um, good relationship with many of the business owners, landowners, and uh, also the government. So it's something that we want to continue to build on, uncover new opportunities to be able to build uh, future earning gro growth for our uh, investors. Thank you. Let's see what's the next question. From Chiu Ping Pua, are there plans to lease the development business of CL under a different entity after privatization? Going forward. <laughs> Hi, uh, Chiu Ping. Uh, post restructuring, the CL will be 100% owned by um, CLA, which is a fully owned subsidiary of uh, Tomasek. I think this question uh, should be discussed and uh, be decided by the shareholder of CL. Uh, and not be, I mean, we won't be in a position to discuss this. Thank you. All right. From Piers again, can you tell me more about how the management team and expertise will change? What changes or areas of improvement in terms of skill set have been identified? I think we will spend more time getting people who are more uh, experienced in the fund management space 
uh, if you look at the history of Capital Land, I think we have uh, built a good track record, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the in the REIT space. I think private equity is, is something that we can definitely do more. So we will be focusing our attention to bring to strengthening our team in this space, and also to bring in people that can help in the capital raising efforts, uh, because capital raising is a big part of the asset management business. You can raise capital from sovereign wealth fund, from pension funds, from high net worth individual, from family offices, and across different markets. So that's definitely a, a skill set and a, a, a team that we definitely need to build up. Of course, um, you know, as a, always an ongoing effort that we must always have strong boots on the ground, very well uh, connected, uh, um, headed by the local uh, colleagues, good network so that they can pick up the phone, they know who, who to call, what events to attend, so that they can constantly be on the lookout for good opportunities to buy assets at, uh, uh, off the market. Thank you. All right. Kandipan Ragasamy again. Will CLI be raising capital to the public, i.e. a rights issue, in order to grow the AUM in the near term? Andrew? Uh, we have no plans to do so, um, but I will say, uh, Kandipan, that one of the reasons why we think it's important to list CLI is the potential for CLI to trade above NAV. In the past, when CL has traded, you know, typically at a you know twenty percent, twenty five percent discount to NAV, it is much much more challenging for us to come to shareholders if we see something that is requires equity because that equity is, is very expensive in your eyes. However, if you have a business that is able to consistently trade above the NAV value, um, as we are seeing with uh, many of the REIMs out there, then our ability to come to shareholders when we have a good idea, a good investment idea, a good strategic acquisition idea, it will be much easier for us to come to you because you will see that the share price is doing well and it will be a cheaper equity call for your share, for shareholders in so doing. So whilst we have uh, very fundamental strategic reasons for doing so, for, for this restructuring, uh, sharpening our focus, unlocking value over the short and long term, this ability for CLI to ideally trade well coming out of the gate will give us an important ability uh, in accessing equity should we need to do so. But the short answer to your question is that there are no plans for us to come to shareholders anytime soon post-listing. Thank you. Well, on that note, um, well, I have uh, our dialogue session has come to an end. Thank you, Chikun. Thank you, Andrew. Shareholders of Capital Land, you have no doubt heard from Chikun and Andrew on the rationale on why Capital Land has embarked on this major transformation. I hope most of your questions and queries have been answered and you are able to make a better informed decision at the coming EGM. A reminder that Capital Lens EGM will be held on 10th of August, Tuesday at 2 p.m., followed by the scheme meeting at 2.15 p.m. With this note, I wish everybody, everyone, a good evening, stay safe, take care, and goodbye. Good night. <laughs>